Four and a half years ago, during the summer of 2008, my wife and I hiked the Moline Range Skyline Trail, situated in the Canadian Rockies near Jasper, Alberta. Its rugged terrain and breathtaking views left a strong impression on me. On the same trip, we also visited the Pacific Rim National Park near Tofino, Vancouver Island, and Wells Gray Provincial Park in the BC interior, famous for its countless rapids and waterfalls. Not only did we photograph the landscape, but I also made audio recordings, mostly of water, the trickle of creeks, the roar of waves and waterfalls. Initially, I envisioned a grand symphony 45 minutes long that would capture everything I had experienced. But good sense persuaded me to curb my ambition. The result? Symphony No. 1, Moline Range, a 20-minute work in one movement inspired by the Jasper Hike. Someday I hope to continue from where I had left off. That opportunity came during my residency with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. I pitched the idea of a water-themed symphony, and the organization agreed, programming it, appropriately, with Benjamin Britten's Sea Interludes. In late September 2012, I set to work on the piece by outlining in words the general character of the work. From this early stage, I determined it would be in three contrasting movements. The first, in moderate tempo, about the ocean at Tofino. The second, very slow, about the adjacent temperate rainforest. And the third, very fast, about rapids and waterfalls. As I pondered the work's sound world and shape, I read a bit about fluid dynamics, the study of fluid motion, and the differences between laminar, or smooth, and turbulent, or rough, flows. During one of several stimulating discussions on the subject with my brother, Dave, a professor researching fluid dynamics at the University of Calgary, he drew my attention to a classic depiction of turbulence by Leonardo da Vinci, the drawing Studies of Water Passing Obstacles and Falling, from the early 16th century. In the lower portion of the drawing, da Vinci illustrates multiple length scales of swirling eddies interacting with one another, typical of turbulent flow. Although varying in size, these eddies are described as being self-similar. They resemble one another in shape, but nevertheless swirl asynchronously. This gives the turbulent water a sense of coherence. It isn't complete chaos. Yet the self-similarity is tempered by randomness and unpredictability. The tension between the expected and the unexpected struck me as musical, and I exploited it in the first movement by presenting many wave-like and undulating patterns, sometimes in succession, but often superimposed. At the movement's climax, for instance, six rhythmic patterns sound simultaneously, just as the movement's principal theme breaks through in the trombones, launching the recapitulation. But the sonata form movement neither begins nor ends in a turbulent state. On the day we roamed Long Beach on the Pacific, it was cold, overcast, misty and drizzly, perfectly moody, a place to warm the soul, but not the skin. The piece opens with a mysterious wave-like theme. This theme, the ocean's raw force, is pitted against a glowing, undulating one, the joy provoked by its contemplation. After exploring the beach, we retreated into the nearby temperate rainforest where an unusual serenity overcame me. In this sanctuary, the ocean's din is muffled by lush green saturated vegetation, a protective canopy formed by towering moss-covered trees and the patter of rain on the forest floor. Nature's Womb To recreate the intimacy I experienced, I pared down the orchestra to strings alone. The homogenous sound of the strings though capable of an infinite number of variations in timbre, seemed analogous to a monochromatic world of greenery, replete with many textures, from fuzzy mosses to angular ferns. To evoke the light patter of rain, I turned to a simple stochastic technique, 
Not trusting myself to intuitively recreate the randomness of Drizzle, I used an algorithm to generate random strings of numbers that helped me design a composite texture comprised of seven independent layers. Taking my cue from one of the most famous works for strings alone, Von Williams' Fantasia on a theme of Thomas Tallis, I subdivided the strings. Von Williams' Fantasia scored for two spatially separated orchestras and a solo quartet. My movement consists of more soloists, the principal desk forming a solo octet, enveloped quite literally like a forest embrace by the remaining strings. But my strings are not spatially separated, as it seemed impractical and disruptive to play musical chairs in the middle of a larger work. Yet despite all the technical planning that went into this movement, the result, I think, is far from dry. If anything, it's remarkably neo-romantic, the lyrical center of the work. It took me about two months to complete the first two movements. My deadline was fast approaching. I now had just one month left for the finale. This was to be a short, lively closer. The problem was that I chose a blisteringly fast tempo. Although only five minutes long, half the length of the first movement, it ultimately spanned 316 bars, more than the 268 in the first. In other words, I had a lot of notes to write. The finale was inspired by Wells Gray Provincial Park, a landscape scattered with rapids and waterfalls of all sizes and force. The climax of the movement depicts the monumental Helmkin Falls, Canada's fifth highest at 137 meters. My wife and I had crept up to the edge of the canyon, peering down on our bellies at the thundering falls below. Later that same day, I sat on a rock in the sun, safely removed from the cliff and jotted down a the theme that the falls had inspired in me, the only music sketched on the trip that ended up in the symphony. Ironically, this theme for trombones, rather than tumbling downwards like a waterfall, does the very opposite. It ascends stepwise with repeated notes and is played staccato. In the symphony, I developed it with imitation, suggesting echoes ricocheting off the canyon walls. The theme culminates in a version harmonized for full brass. Yet the movement begins understatedly, upstream and backed far from the falls. I imagined bobbing down a bubbling creek that becomes a rapids that ultimately reaches the falls itself. The strings are tacit in this pre-falls music, the focus now on the woodwinds. Percussion, other than timpani and harp, make their very first appearance here. The material for this gurgling rapids music consists of a dozen or so repeating fragments mostly paired in light instruments, oboes, clarinets, and so on. After sketching the fragments, one per system, I entered them into the computer, printed and cut them out. I remembered reading about one of Stravinsky's compositional methods that involved him placing musical fragments on a coffee table and rearranging them until he was satisfied. I did the same with my fragments. And in another nod to Stravinsky, I piled them up, one on top of the other, at the climax of this opening section. After several grueling months during which I had been composing almost seven days a week, it was hugely satisfying to receive the box of parts and scores from the printer. My name is Robert Rival, composer in residence with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. I hope you have the opportunity to hear Symphony No. 2, Water, live in concert. 
Thank you for watching.